Hello and welcome to your award-winning The Reasons I'm Broke podcast, bringing you the reasons we're broke every single week through news and headlines ranging from comics, movies, TV, video games, and more. I'm Daniel, and today we are going through a retrospective sector as we take a look at 2008's Speed Racer. And joining me this week, the other host who volunteered for this retrospective is Jared. Welcome back, Jared. Thanks, Daniel. It's nice to be back. And thank you very much for revisiting this, what is over a decade old movie, one that I've really enjoyed, and I went to theaters to see it, and it's been overlooked, I think it's been underrated, I know it didn't perform well, but just a couple of facts about this guy before we jump right into the our actual thoughts about Speed Racer. It was directed and written by Lana and Lily Wachowski, who of course are known for The Matrix. It stars Emile Hirsch from Into the Wild, Matthew Fox from Lost, Christina Ritchie from Buffalo 66, and Susan Sarandon from Thelma and Louise. He's going to be very good. No, he's going to be the best if they don't destroy him first. So this one, uh, it did not do well after closing its run in theaters. It took in a worldwide amount of 93945766 So this was against a production estimate of over $120 million. They considered it a box office bomb. But in 2018, Emil did put out a tweet that said that a sequel for Speed Racer has a, cri- has a script that's been written. It doesn't mean much, but I guess it gives us a little bit of hope. And according to the producer, Joel Silver, this movie was largely shot in green screen in 60 days. There was uh, all kinds of neat little trivia that I was able to find. There's a couple more here, but let's jump into our initial thoughts as we rewatch this. Uh, this one, Jared, is it one that is it, was this your first time seeing it or had you seen it before? Oh, no, I saw it um, pretty close to when it came out. I mean, I've, I've watched it like multiple times. Like, I really, really enjoyed the movie and I, I'm not honestly 100% sure why because like it's it's not from a film perspective it's not great but if you think about the era that it came out in it was probably at the time one of the best animated adaptations into live action that we'd seen at that point especially anime specifically because it has such a reputation among weebs of like anytime they do a live action anime it's gonna be bad would they assume and i'm like speed racer was fucking amazing i, I consider that even a, a regular good movie i'll, I'll watch yeah. that over most cinema I, when i say it's not like a, a you know a quote good movie i mean it's not like you know you know goodfellas or mm. you know the departed or the stop naming scarcity movies um <laughs> but <laughs> You know what I mean? It's not like that. It's a popcorn movie, but it's a very good popcorn yeah. movie. It it did what you want to see. Like the the way that they shot the racing, I really want to know what those cars are made out of. You know, <laughs> things like that. One thing that I kind of came to mind as I was watching these, because I was trying to figure out, okay, what went wrong when it hit the box office? And I think one of the mistakes and maybe you're you know as i'm trying to look at this from a movie studio perspective you have the wachowskis who seem to bring in some box office you know that they have given you one of the biggest movies of all time with the matrix so you're probably going to give them some trust as to what they want to make and both of them being anime fans they wanted to adapt speed racer and this is a project that's been in the works since the 90s up and down in development hell nick cage was attached at one point to star in a 90s speed racer live action so this one they it finally came through and they're like all right we got the wachowskis in there it pro- it had a pretty moderate, pretty decent budget in there. You got actors like, like Emil Hirsch, who was up and coming, which was a pretty big deal. You've got these special effects that were pretty different for the time. You didn't really see a largely green screen, hyper colored type of film like this one. I can't think of another one that even resembles this. Even rewatching it now, I'm like, whoa, there's a lot happening here with the scene transitions. There's always action going on. There's never like really a still moment as you're seeing this. They filmed it as if they were trying to make it into a literally a real life Americanized anime with all of the moving backgrounds, with the gasps and everything, exactly like Speed Racer. Yeah, no, like it, it like the way that they adapted it was really, really well done. The the colors, the even the little things like um, at the end where you see the him looking at all the camera flashes and then 
Trixie comes up and they do the kiss and all the camera flashes turn into little hearts like flashing. It it is literally what like the anime would be, but with real people. Also that same like just moments before that when he's going into the finish line and he's doing like the twist and it kind of looks like a spiral of that checkered finish line which is just like the show and then he finally lands and then they just found really creative ways to make the backgrounds a part of the action so when you have like the swishing lines in that fight scene where they're in the himalayas or wherever they are yeah and you see the snowflakes when they're punching the snowflakes because of the speed of each punch and throw they turn into those swishy background lines so they found practical ways in a weird way to make those backgrounds happen without just having them occur like in the cartoon yeah no it was it's honestly like the uh the backgrounds are almost like a character in the movie it is mm-hmm. so much of a focus on what they did. One of the things when I was also revisiting this is Speed Racer is not a property that's that you would aim at kids in, in a weird way because most people that grew up on this cartoon, a little background on the first time I watched it, my mom grew up on Speed Racer as a kid. So as a result of that, I watched Speed Racer as a kid a little bit and then I went back and revisited. I bought the collection when that came out. They did a Blu-ray collection as well and rewatched those. But if you're trying to make this movie, it's almost as if Maybe they were hoping that it would capture kids because of the racing and the colors and everything, but also the adults. I do think that this is a movie for both kids and adults. It does work in that way. But when you're looking at it from a marketing perspective, I could almost see how it didn't do well on the box office. And I almost think it may have done better as maybe an R-rated or PG-13 adaptation as opposed to I think this ended up being PG. Yeah, I can see where that would be the case from a marketing perspective. But honestly, like uh, when I rewatched it this last week and like I watched it with my kid, he, he's five. He loves racing like nice. he likes fast cars and he, he loved it. <laughs> Did you notice the scene where speed is he's racing in the final one? He says, get that shit off my track. <laughs> yes, I <did. laughs> he curses twice. And I'm like, how's this PG? <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, like, you know, from that perspective, like, I'm like, uh, it's weird because, like, watching it with my kid, I do notice things like that more. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, when I'm just watching something and somebody curses, like, that's just part of how I talk. Mm-hmm. But then when, like, you know, your kid's there, you're like, oh, I didn't notice that before. Oh, <laughs> mm, maybe this isn't the best. <laughs> but, I mean, it those two were, like, nothing he hasn't heard out of my mouth at one point or another. Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, no, it was, I think it, it would have been kind of interesting to see it as an R rated movie, especially when you look there's at a the, lot more you can do with like the, the violence part of it. And the, although I, I really do enjoy the campy, like, you know, bam style. True. But also if you look at the anime there, <laughs> speed's getting out of his car and kicking ass all the time, uh, throwing oh, yeah. people off the fucking cliffs and shit, murdering people <laughs> left and right. Yeah, that's why it was funny to me when they're like in the movie, they're kind of like, oh, you know, the, the the rally and it's so dangerous and, you know, they they cheat and stuff like that. I'm like, he punches people a lot. <laughs> like, nobody's noticed this before. <laughs> Let, let's talk about the cast here that they have on here, because John Goodman, I think, is probably the most talented actor out of the bunch. And awesome that they got him on here as Pops. And the, the the fact that in the story itself, and I don't remember how, it, it's pretty original as far as the setup of Speed's brother running off, trying to do the right thing to fix racing, and then there being this scene of death and the family kind of going through it, and then suddenly him having to face that situation again with Speed, but now handling it in a way of like he gets to correct his old behavior or this is what I should have done instead of trying to push my son away with, if you leave, you're not coming back. Instead, he was like, well, before you leave, let's have a chat. And then that ends up being what kind of clears up the conversation and clears up the air between the two characters. And John Goodman, you know, you have his scenes where he's being silly and and yelling at at his kids, but, you know, he really nailed so much of the father and son aspects that the show or the manga did not really have. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, John Goodman's always been good at that. Even on like, you know, like earlier stuff like Roseanne, like that was really his character's strong suit was like those serious moments. Whereas like he was great, you know, because the show's 
obviously like mostly a comedy and so is the movie in an in a respect but he's he's always had a talent for that particular thing and it kind of makes me wonder if they had cast somebody else would they have gone the same way with those moments yeah that's true i don't i don't know if it would have been as effective if it wouldn't work would have worked as well and he fits the role he pretty much looks like pops except they went with a non-silly pops in this case he's more serious he's strict uh, so they, they actually did take some liberties with some of the characters here. They didn't do a whole lot with Susan Sarandon as the mom. She, yeah. I, I felt like they kind of left her pretty two dimensional. She is there to, she's there for her kids. She's there for her family, but she doesn't have any really solid moments outside of telling speed that when he races, it's as if she's seeing someone make artwork, but that's one character that I'm like, you have Susan Sarandon here. Like, let's get something else right there too. Where's her pops moment. Yeah, no, it would have been cool to see her kind of be a little bit more of a focus. But I mean, even in the show, it was mostly, you know, about speed and then Pops being his, you know, team owner, mechanic, car builder. So, I mean, it kind of rang true a little bit to me because, you know, if you've got that kind of father son relationship and that's the focus of the story, the mom is kind of there in a support role a lot of the time, just like, you know, especially like kind of when like your kids are little, like the mom's kind of the primary thing for the most part for them but you know as a dad you're you're there kind of in a support role until Mm -hmm. they usually get older and then you know every once in a while you get like that nice talk with your kid you know what i mean or you know you get that that moment which she had with that part about him racing and she was an integral part of it because at that moment he's like trying to figure out if he wants to keep doing this or if he should keep doing it yeah and it's another incredible casting that they did with both Susan and John Goodman in that case. Uh, one of the, I guess the only weak, weaker casting that I would say, and there's, there's two kids in this. There was the young speed racer and then there's speed's youngest brother, uh, Spurtle and the young speed. I, I, there was like the one scene where he's saying, please, please, please to his brother. Where I was like, all right, let's get another take in there. It doesn't seem like he's excited <laughs> to go. You know what I mean? Like he's just reading the line. So uh, that I haven't shaken still when I watched that movie. However, like Spurdo, I love Paul, Paulie lit is the actor's name and he fucking cracked me up. Like, I know he's there for the kids, him and the monkey, like, you, you know, comedic relief, but you oh, know, yeah. he's throwing up the middle finger and he's fucking funny. And I believe him as this little scrappy little brother. That's all about racing. And he calls out the villain <laughs> most, the whole movie. Yeah, no, he called, and they they sneak onto the airplane and try to get the candy and <laughs> like I mean it, 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 he does a great job, but yeah, he's definitely there for like that comedic relief. And I mean, it's a monkey. Come on, it's great. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like you can't put a monkey in a movie and have it be bad. Right. Uh, what'd you end up thinking of the choice of villain in the motivation? How he tries to essentially buy up the best racers and and work the stock market who is he's a villain that's essentially there for the money that's his main motivator i i think it was a really good choice i think it's a pretty realistic version because i mean if you think about how a lot of like really large companies operate like it granted it's a little weird that like their entire world it's kind of like how pokemon's a little weird because like their entire economy is based on 10 year olds fighting each other <laughs> right um with their pets but this economy is obviously like all about racing. Like the largest companies in the world are ones that build race cars and engines and stuff. And it, it it's a, a little weird, but if you look at it from that perspective, I mean, if you look at like the largest companies in, in our world, you know, Google, Amazon, they buy up competition and, and fix things all the time. So, I mean, it, it makes sense from that perspective. I love that Royalton, they played it as like, this just like the rest of the movie so it shouldn't surprise me but i still enjoy that they made him like this over the top and my coworker was telling me that i guess he does a bunch of plays the uh actor roger alum and as royalton you can kind of see that where it's it's as if he's in a play he's really playing up the aspect of you're gonna regret this and, <laughs> and he's yelling and he's throwing shit and he's giving these long speeches about racing's not real it's all fixed this is all a business <laughs> and the whole time i'm like yeah like i'm convinced like come on yeah, speed no. fucking just sign up he he was he was super good in it honestly i, I always when i was younger i always confused that actor with um and i'm trying to i'm blanking on the name but the the guy that played alfred in the batman with christian bale oh michael kane yeah 
they always kind of have like a similar vibe, but he's like the cartoon version. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I've seen him in other things. Yeah. And like they've both kind of got that same kind of accent. Their face is mildly similar, but he's he's literally. Yeah, because I think he's got that strong stage acting experience that, yeah, he can do that over the top, like and still make it work on film, which is impressive. And he also gives us the main motivator behind and this is where even me, when I'm just playing this in the background, I got I get a little lost in the plot here. And I imagine that this is the part where it's like this isn't kids are probably not going to get this. And this is more for the adults where they're talking about the stock market. They're talking about they own Worldton owns the only type of engine except for his competition, which he wants to buy out because then that would make him a, essentially a monopoly as far as the racing world and the economy, as you mentioned, that this whole world is built on. And when he makes these deals to try to buy out this other company and Speed ends up getting double-crossed in a way and, and it drives up the stock price that way that this guy's company goes up in value, this, this, these, are kind, these are parts of the movie that I'm like, all right, this is kind of a little complex for like a Speed Racer movie. Did you feel like... I know I struggled a bit as I was trying to, okay, why is this happening? Why are they trying to, who, why is this a bad thing that they did not, that they did win? I thought that was what they were trying to do. Did you kind of feel that way too? I guess a li- probably the first few times I've watched it, but like the, this last time, like it, it kind of made sense. But honestly, like me personally, I'm a very, like, I'm very into like politics and, and business and those kind of things these days. So now it kind of tracked pretty easily. But I also kind of immerse myself in like news from that area of like existence, I guess would be the <laughs> word. So, I mean, it, it actually does follow pretty logical sense. Like that makes a lot of sense that like, you know, you recruit these two guys to come help you and make them a false promise and just to, you know, drive your stock price up and get more money like that seems pretty legit. Like people do that kind of stuff. And it, that could be a, a place where, well, that's it for the movie. But thankfully, we have this part of uh, the his younger sister i think it was who says look this wasn't right for them to do here's your invitation to the grand prix and it ends up ending on this big race which conveniently exposes royalton for cheating at the grand prix and and making his company not look great even if he had you know just by losing alone losing to speed racer which ended up crashing that whole deal. It put him in jail. It helped the inspector get the evidence that he needed. And you also had that type of, like, they did well as far as their end. Like, yeah, they didn't keep their end of the deal, but they ended up testifying against Royalton, which put him away. So a lot of things did end up conveniently going into place, but it was all for, you know, characters kind of doing the right thing in the end. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's plot armor. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, oh, well, we about to end the movie. Better fix all this stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, it was kind of neat. Um, I did like the character of the sister. She always kind of seemed a little bit like off from that, which is very realistic again in, you know, especially like Asian culture, like the, the father son, like he was going to pass the business down to his son, but mm-hmm. they couldn't because they're going to get bought out. So like they kind of teamed together to like kind of make this thing work. And then she goes, you guys are dicks. And then just kind of, you know, goes off on her own thing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of a bit of a trope, honestly. But That's true. it works. It it does. And then, you know, Speed gets that last minute, like, what he needed. And they built the car in, like, three days. <laughs> <laughs> the Mach 12? <laughs> yeah. The, or 6. Uh, the Mach 6. The Mach 6, yes. Um, which looked gorgeous, by the mm-hmm. way. That was a really like the things they did to modify it from the Mach Five were like the headlights being a little bit more streamlined. I am really curious as to what like kind of regulations for what the cars can be are in this <laughs> world of racing because everybody seems like all right NASCAR for instance like in Formula One your car is inspected like up until race time. When are they putting in these hooks that attach to other cars with like a metal cable and like they get away with an awful lot, but. If you think about like the guys who own the league, it's all the guys that like to cheat. So yeah. they would probably make it purposely hard to actually regulate. Yeah, that's very true. And that's one of the things that also pops and the rest of the family. They were able to kind of break their own record of let's build this machine. How fast can we do it? And the whole family got involved in doing it. 
uh, pro probably at around the speed that Royalton was supposedly promising if he were to use all his tools. And it ended up working out great. I hope there is a Mach 6 or a Mach 5 somewhere on studio lots because I know I'll, most of this movie is green screen. But they hopefully had to sit on something that, or even if they made one just to promote the fucking movie, I want oh, either one to exist. Oh man, that's like a, I hit the lottery and I find it and buy it kind of thing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like that. That and I want a uh, a Christian Bale Batmobile. Oh I'm yeah, the so tank, bad, which yeah. is actually a military vehicle. So you probably could technically buy one that's been like decommissioned and whatnot. You wouldn't have like the guns and, and rocket launchers and stuff. But right, probably. How fun would that be to like take to the store? <laughs> <laughs> one of the my favorite parts of this movie when i first saw it and still when i watch it today is the racer x story because this is something that they took from the anime and the manga where you don't know his identity and he's constantly reminding the, the audience like oh speed doesn't know that i'm his brother and i died a long time ago or so they think but and he's constantly telling you in every single episode so he and speed never figures it out from what i remember that it's his brother and in this case so i'm going in with this knowledge when i'm seeing it in theaters of okay well his brother scott porter he plays his uh younger self as racer x ends up dying and i'm like okay well here's racer x now i know that's his brother but then towards the end of the well third a third of the way through or whatever halfway through they reveal he's like no i'm not your brother your brother did die and his face is completely different they give you a completely different actor and i got fooled by that because i'm like oh shit this is a, a like this is for the fans of speed racer of no this is not his brother it's not what you think it is his brother really did die, which would have also given it its own dynamic. And they end up being doing this great thing where at the very end, they tell you, no, it really is his brother, which is yet another bonus. But if they had even left it like that, I thought that was really impressive that they had the boss to just be like, for a moment, this is not Speed's brother. This is a different character. Yeah, no, that part was really good. Although, honestly, like that whole storyline does feel a bit out of like the soap operas my mom used to watch <laughs> with like, oh, no, they died, but they really didn't. They got facial reconstruction surgery. And nobody knows who they are. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was really well done. Um, I think uh, Matthew Fox did a really great job with that role, too. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if, if they had gotten Porter on to do a racer and i know that's the reason they got two different actors so they can fool the audience in there but for him to jump in and do the racer x thing he's working for the inspector he's trying to do this he he really is playing that part of and i still saw him as that what the audience saw him or the people that live in that world saw speed's brother towards the end is like a dirty racer he definitely races outside the rules he pushes the boundaries he knows he has to he's he, it's life or death with these things so to, he pulled off that off really well of like yeah he's still a good guy but he will <laughs> punch a fucking guy in the face as they're flipping over him and he'll do shit that needs to be done to to live yeah no 100 percent. and i mean I, I just, I don't, the one thing I don't understand is, like, all of this is, like, televised. Yeah. And, like, the camera angles they had in the movie, I'm assuming that's similar to how it's, like, televised in that world. Hmm. How are people not seeing this stuff? All of the weird, like, weapons at the yeah, keys like and the shit. Gadgets and, like, like, it's just normal that people, like, just blow up in the middle of a desert run. Like, that's <laughs> just, oh, yeah, no, that happens. Like, how? What did they hit? Well, I do like that the announcers were saying when they were going through Monte Cristo and there's the desert and they're like, oh, the, the, the sand makes it really hard to see what's going on in there. And they mentioned that some of these racers might do things that are illegal, but only if they're caught. So it's almost as if it's known that that's oh, yeah, a part no. of the race. It's known, but it's also denied at the same time. Yes, right. Which is just so real. <laughs> that's true. There's so many things. <laughs> um but no it was um and then like they've got that one spot in the mountains where like nobody can see anything and then Trixie changes out of the out of the car and then all of a sudden like the goons show up and they're there for like 20 minutes and then they're like barely behind the leaders again and i'm like how far ahead were they <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you do see a bunch of different characters that i think were were memorable in their own way. They found ways to like, okay, we're Worldton's hiring all of these bounty hunters and and other illegal racers, just anyone that's willing to take out Speed and his crew. 
and they each have their little gadgets like the guy with the bees there's the the viking people <laughs> with the giant yeah. axes and shit and it's they just the snake guy yeah yeah you kept throwing snakes at the other racers and <laughs> he was so ridiculous and they're like hey how did these snakes get in there i don't know maybe it was the guy with the giant snake on his helmet like <laughs> He had the snake uh, pattern on his suit and everything. Yeah, that was his whole like, thing. Yeah, like his whole car was decked out as a snake. And they're like, hey, who keeps throwing snakes at other racers? I don't know. <laughs> so weird. Not me. Obviously, all the snakes were used from my car. <laughs> and I know part of it was probably to sell different toys and, and get like, okay, we need the different themed characters and villains. But it worked out for the movie itself, too, where they hire these different tribes and different gang members and different like all these themed characters to put them in here. So again, it's all a natural part of it. And I know that they probably had the Warner Brothers merch department tell them, well, make sure you have at least this many different vehicles so we can make toys. Because we know they do that with superhero movies, for example, where they have to have this big vehicle that they all get in or at least two more suits for the character so they can sell different versions of the toy. But in this case, to me, it wasn't blatant. It was natural with the story. And it's easy to do when you're working in a racing movie. Yeah, no, it, it was actually, I mean, for what it is, it, it's a little ridiculous. That there's like these like guys that just race as Vikings. <laughs> but... I mean, from a toy perspective, that's pretty cool. There was also this plot where Speed's kind of disillusioned by, and I know we talked a little bit about this with Royalton, where he was talking about how all the Grand Prix had been fixed. There was Ben Burns that they had talked about, and he pretty much admits to Speed, you know, it's funny that a lot of people thought that we hated each other, and that's kind of where he leaves it. And that pretty much confirmed to Speed that all the Grand Prix had been fixed, and what Royalton said was right. He then goes and tells Pops all of this information himself. And Pops is like, you believe Royalton? That's not true. Uh, I still got the impression, I don't know if you can came to the same conclusion, that they were all still fixed up until this one, that Speed won. Yeah, no, I, I think they were 100% fixed. Uh, that tracks so much. I mean, if you think about just sports in our world and like the history, like people have been fixing basketball games and mm -hmm. races and, and all that stuff for like a long time. And, you know, sometimes they get caught, and that's the ones you hear about. So, you know, it's it's kind of like, you know, you never hear about the best art thieves because they, you don't know who they are. Right. You don't know who the best cheaters are, best fixers are, because they do it in a way that they don't get caught. Yeah, I'm glad you came to the same conclusion, because I, I felt that that also better ended the movie of like, okay, this was the first, in sort of a way, the first like real race or an honest race where they didn't know already who was going to win and speed was like the one thing that was going to change racing forever which is what racer x was trying to do speed's brother and they were able to to change that for hopefully for moving forward especially with royalton out of the way yeah no i mean basically the the moral of the story is that he john wicked the race <laughs> <laughs> like he was just too good that the fixing didn't work <laughs> i love that part in the beginning where he's like He's like, stop him. We're, he's, we're trying to, sir. He's just too fast. And the villain's like, mm, and he pushes the guy out of the way. <laughs> it's so great. Oh, man. And then, like, I love the announcers that they go through. Yes. Like, all the different languages and stuff. And I'm like, isn't this, like, some kind of, like, as far as this world goes, isn't this some, like, back what woods, like, racetrack? Like, why do they all care so much? <laughs> what it was, like, it was, like, their local track, like, you know, Speed's brother would just go there to practice like whenever he wanted. Like, this yeah. is not a large, you can't do that at Daytona. <laughs> One of the racers in, that were, that they were switching through was actually the original voice of Speed in the anime. So uh, I thought that was a neat throwback. It's the older guy with the thick glasses and he's got that hat on and he's the one oh, who says. Oh, that's neat. I, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, where he's like, his brother would be very proud. And then it shows a shot of like Racer X and Shadow. Yeah, that that was him. And they also That's really cool. They also worked in Trixie, but I don't I still haven't found which one which character she is if she's one of the announcers or someone in the crowd. But uh, yeah, that was one of the neat things that they put in there for the fans. Uh, with the Wachowski's behind the directing, we know that they do martial arts really well and and action scenes. As far as when they got out 
and were fighting some of these villains, they definitely car- made it more cartoony, more like when Pops is flipping that ninja over and over again and it turns into like this cycle like you would see in Looney Tunes and stuff. Yeah. Um, when I rewatched it, I kind of was hoping to see a little bit more of like that fight with Racer X and the ninja where it's legitimate martial arts and actual choreography. Uh, and I felt like we just got that one scene and I, I was like, oh man, you have the Wachowskis. It would have been cool if we got more of that fighting between the different characters yeah it would have been neat but honestly i feel like it's a little bit out of place if you do it with anybody other than like either speed or racer x so like because the rest of them are are a lot more cartoony characters and i mean even racer x is really the only one that's like kind of even semi-serious yeah and that's kind of and i wouldn't expect you know any of the speed family outside of speed to do any of those things but if maybe there had been an extra fight scene with speed and racer x teaming up again or even when they're all in that middle of that race and they're they have the guns and they're fighting like that would have been another opportunity to have some more of that choreography where where, you know right when he squishes that ninja underneath the sofa but before that they had this great exchange back and forth and that's when i was reminded i'm like oh yeah it's the matrix people (laughs) like yeah and then it's like all right well that scene's over (laughs) Well, again, though, that kind of just goes to the, uh, you know, the Matrix was at its time one of the best, you know, special effects showcases. And then, I mean, this also did an incredible job with what you could do with a green screen. It really did, because there was never a moment in which you can see it in movies now, like in Jurassic Park 3, where they're clearly in front of a green screen and then it cuts back to a regular shot. But in this case, yeah, everything is green screen. And because of that, it never, I don't know, to me, it never really felt like they weren't there which is weird to say because we know that everything in that world is is not real everything there is not a set uh, as far as i can tell like nothing <laughs> really was a set there maybe the little classroom but even that i'm sure was surrounded by green screen just to make it colorful and bright and green and maybe that's why it worked so well because normally i'm a very big critic of using green screen and like superhero movies and all of that where it's like okay it's a little overused sometimes and now here's a movie where they literally that's all they use and somehow i'm okay with it <laughs> like it's kind of bizarre well i think it honestly it comes down to a lot of it's like green screen is often used poorly gotcha and, and that's what we don't like but also too it's it's most often seen because it's a break from what you've been looking at yes where you can see where it switches to green screen and that's what bothers me and i I know that's usually what bothers other people because it makes it apparent but when you use it throughout the entire film it's a lot easier to like okay this is just how this world looks where you're immersed in it and none of it seems jarring once you're really immersed in it exactly like you just kind of your your brain adjusts to okay these are the colors like i mean their house looked like almost something out of edward scissorhands yeah (laughs) Like, it was just, like, this bright kind of pastel like, oversaturated. Like, everything is oversaturated. You can even see it in, like, John Goodman's face a little bit. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, let's talk about the racing decisions that they, the Wachowskis and, and the crew involved ended up going with as far as how the cars moved and the type of racing that they, they ended up going with. They took more liberties with how they kind of, I think, modernize is the right word for it. It's not your standard race like you would have in the manga or in the anime. They do all kinds of spins constantly. They have the jumping that he uses towards uh, it in his advantage to smash the other cars. They have that technology in it where, in my head, I'm like, okay, they 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 died because that's how the speed racer <laughs> is. You, your car blows up and they're dead. But they'll have like the bubble that surrounds them, and that's how the racers are saved. That's like their airbag, I guess, in a way. Yeah, they've it's, got like this ejection bubble. Yeah, because it's obviously way more destructive. And as soon as that bubble saves them, then they're perfectly fine. But as far as the stylistic choices with how they're going through all of these different obstacles, the different spins that they're constantly doing, they're literally fighting like in mid race as like bumping their cars back and forth. It's way more than like than what you got in in regular racing it's it's them almost embodying the vehicles and almost practically punching each other while they're trying to get to first place and while they're trying to destroy the other's vehicle and when i first saw it i was kind of thrown off by the constant spinning that the cars would do as they're running around because to me i guess it didn't make sense like how are they maintaining momentum though and all that but from now having seen it so many times Mm -hmm. it's a natural part of it where it's like okay this is how these vehicles work in this 
world or future, whatever it may be. And uh, uh, what what do you think of them changing that racing dynamic in this in Speed Racer? I mean, I have questions from an engineering perspective because that's not generally how a four wheeled car, where all four wheels like you know face a direction and then like the front one turn would move. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, again, I think it comes down to like they made a decision and they did it consistently throughout the movie, so it works. If like all of a sudden in the last race there was just all this spinning and stuff, then it it wouldn't work. But because, you know, they, they just established very early on that this is how these cars move and this is how the racing is done, it, it does work. I don't understand how any of them wreck because when they're bouncing around and spinning and punching right. each other with the cars, they don't really seem to take any damage. Like, they just seem fine. Like, the only damage, really, that happened to the Mach 6 in the Grand Prix is when he's, like, sliding on the front fender into the finish line. <laughs> yeah, and he's going so fast that the fucking we the tires melted. Yeah, like, it, it's it's just odd. And then also, like, they have things, like, in the, the Grand Prix where, like, if one of your tires pops, another one's going to pop out and inflate, like, <laughs> in real time. It's going to be fine. I'm like, why wouldn't they just do that on all the cars if they know how to do that? Because then, like, you don't have tire changes. A tire, you know, comes off or melts or whatever, and you just, a new one just pops into place. I thought that was one of the coolest upgrades that they gave speed where they're like, we've made some modifications to the Mach 5 and they go through all of these things. This, this button does this. But to me, I was most impressed with that tire one. I was like, oh, cool. And then you see it happen where he yeah. hits the jump button. And then while he's in midair, he hits the change tire button and then bloop. Woof, and then he's perfectly fine. I'm like, man, that is so I, fucking useful. I want that on my car so bad. Yes. How did <laughs> you? How you did just shed a tire and a new one pops into place? Like, how do we do this? How do we make this work? Why are we not right. funding this? Where's that engineer that saw this movie and went, why aren't we doing this? Let me get to work and make a billion dollars off of that shit. Yeah, exactly. Like, God, I would, I would spend twice as much on those wheels if I didn't have to go get new tires. <laughs> I'd be popping them on purpose just to do the fucking... <laughs> I don't know about... Well, I mean, honestly, though, there would be people that do that because there's, you know, those idiots that go and buy, like, you know a $1,200 set of tires and then go do burnouts and parking lots all the yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I, I learned that from the fast and furious movies. And <laughs> I think it was Tokyo. Yeah, exactly. Drift. <laughs> like the amount of tires that those guys must go through with like drifting and whatnot. Like that's one thing I think people that like get into that, like in the street side don't really understand at first, because like, if you go to like a racing event, like NASCAR, they bring like 12 sets of tires mm -hmm. when you're going fast and you're going a long time, like your tires wear down. I mean, granted they're also using like super soft material for grip. Yeah. But still like when you, you see like these guys who are out there with like, and they got like the rims and the tire tread, like the sidewall has like, I don't know, an inch. Right. Like those tires go through quickly. Yeah. That was one of my favorite parts of Tokyo drift where he's like, I need another tire change. And he it's where he's practicing how to drift. Yes. And little bow was like, these are, these are expensive. You're going to go through another set. And I'm like, yes. All right. They addressed it in this. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, no, honestly, like Fast and the Furious, like the early ones kind of did a good job of that, honestly. Yeah, they did. Like talking about how much it costs to do this. And, you know, like uh, when was it Hector comes in and drops like a bunch of money on three sets of parts for like three Honda Civics. And they're obviously they're using that as like, oh, maybe he's the guy. But I mean, also he runs Hondas. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know why anybody was surprised. <laughs> Uh, one bit of trivia I did have, too. We were talking about Racer X a little bit. Uh, Scott Porter and Matthew Fox, who play Young Race, young Racer X and the older one, uh, they actually have the same birthday of July 14th, just different years. And <laughs> I thought that was kind of weird. <laughs> that is kind of weird. Yeah, no, that's... I mean, obviously, they didn't do that on purpose, but that's just a neat coincidence. Yeah. I, I also really like Scott Porter, honestly, as, a, as an actor. I think he was in, um, what was it, the show uh, Friday Night Lights? Uh, I looked up his IMDb. I know he's doing Hallmark movies, so I know you've probably seen him in some oh, of those. Oh, yeah, no, I've seen him in a bunch of those, too. <laughs> I, I try not to bring those up because nobody else watches them but me. <laughs> well, <laughs> something cool about Scott Porter, he actually used to be a subscriber at the Orlando comic shop I used to work at. Yeah, he's local. He's also been on a few podcasts that I saw. We should try to get him. Oh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, why not? Let's reach out to him. We'll reach out and like, hey, we would like to do another try at this Speed Racer retrospective. Do you want to come on? Yeah, look, you, we 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 used to give you your I, one of you one of us used to give you your comic books and you used to do your pulls. So come on, let's just let's just do this. Come on, <laughs> come on. 
There's right. like some history here already. It's familiar. Just jump on. We're all friends. It's, it's cool. That was one of the best parts about seeing him in this. And also he ended up, uh, you know, closing out his sub and moving to California to try to do the acting thing. And I didn't know he moved back. I didn't know he was, he was local, lived locally here. He probably has family here. That makes sense. But the fact that then, you know, I looked at his IMDb after Speed Racer and he did a shit ton of voice work for Marvel games and Marvel cartoons. And I thought that was awesome because it's like the guy loves Marvel comics. He loves comic books. So the fact that he also got to voice these characters, it was just kind of like it made me really happy as because I know that the guy's into comics and he's into that stuff. So I was just like, all right, that's great. He, you know. Uh, famously, I don't know if you know this, but he was also in the running for Captain America before they got uh, Chris Evans. Oh, I would have rather had that. I know. <laughs> Although, <laughs> yeah. honestly, like, can you imagine what Scott Porter would look like, like, jacked? Right, yeah. Like, it, it would look kind of weird, I feel like. Also, I, if I recall, he's kind of on the shorter side. That I'm not sure about, because I'm short already, so everyone's taller than me. <laughs> that's You yeah, know, that's fair. I mean, I'm not exactly tall myself, but... <laughs> Uh, you know, Marvel, though, they would have made it work. They do oh, it with yeah. Tom Cruise all the time. Exactly. <laughs> if they can make Tom Cruise an action hero, they can make anybody <laughs> tall. <laughs> so that's the one thing I want to sort of see that universe of where he would have gotten Captain America. But the fact that at least he still got to work with these characters, I'm like, all right, this is great. And and it, it ended up working out well. But yeah, let's let's try to see what what Scott can uh, do as far as Speed Racer and and talking about it or even. A type of future, I I, don't, I think you you and I are in the same boat of we don't expect any kind of Speed Racer 2 to happen. But do you think that the kind of following that Speed is having right now, and I'm seeing some of it as far as people discovering this movie for the first time and kind of seeing how great it is, really, you know, all things considered, it had that bad reputation from anime fans of like, fuck that, it's, an, it's a live action adaptation, look at what happened with Dragon Ball. And oh, yeah. people our age, I guess, at that time also going, yeah, no, let's not watch it. And <laughs> I watched it because I'm a Speed Racer fan. So I yeah. watched it. And now people are kind of coming around on it, which is kind of interesting. Honestly, I can see it. Maybe it's like a Netflix original. You they know buy up I mean? everything, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do. But like they, they tend to like if what they do a lot that I've noticed is like they'll They'll put something like, for instance, on there, and I mean, I know this is on HBO and not Netflix at the moment, but uh, what a lot of these streaming companies do is they'll put up something old and see how it goes. Like, do a lot of people watch this? And then they'll kind of like do something with that franchise, like, you know, a year later, a couple of years later, something like that. I almost feel like a lot of these companies buy up these, you know, these older franchises, or either shows or movies or, you know, stuff like that. Kind of like to go, let's let's see what it does. And if it gets a lot, like we can hope that it's not the case with Green Lantern, for instance. <laughs> but, you know, I, I feel like that they do do that where they're like, oh, man, this we put this movie up. that's like 10 years old and it got a lot of traffic. Like maybe we should look at something. Isn't that how Lucifer? I know they bought up the seasons, but didn't they get the seasons, air them and then announce the new seasons? I believe so. Um, cause I know it was canceled by CW. I, right. I'm honestly not sure about the timeline of like what happened when, but they, they do that with a lot of things. Um, there was another show that I was watching that they did that with, and it kind of, the one thing that irritates me about that is when they take it from, you know, like, cause Lucifer at the beginning, it was a CW show. So it had like, you know, 28 something episodes per year. Yeah. And then you get to the Netflix stuff and there's like 10 and I'm like, oh. yeah, <laughs> Yeah, the format changes quite a bit. Yeah, which, I mean, it, granted, they do cut out a lot of, like, Lucifer in the early days had a lot of, like, you know, the, like, hero of the week kind of situation where, like, there's an overarching storyline that will have, like, five minutes of time per episode, but this episode's about this killer, and I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I don't really care about him. <laughs> well, I think if they were to do or re revive Speed Racer or do a sequel with it, obviously a ton of time has passed for these actors, and since then... I can't really think of a story that they could do. I'm sure they, they, they it's so open-ended as far as like the Grand Prix is one, uh, obviously a more aged speed racer, maybe someone that they would have to reveal in this movie. I think, I don't know if they would just keep it a secret and I guess they can, but that maybe somehow throughout this sequel, he would figure out that it racer X is his brother. Cause there's a dynamic there you can explore of why have you still kept it a secret? Like your family's right there. Even the guy, 
that works with him, the inspector is like, are you, you can go down there with them. And he's like, no, no, I'm not. And he chooses not to go down there and celebrate with his family. It's almost as if there's still that unsolved resentment between him and pops, uh, him and, and the, the racing world, his family, what kind of, uh, it's like they, he put him through a bunch of grief and he doesn't want to face that, I guess, consequence of it. Yeah, I think it's a mixture of that and also, like, you know, to kind of do what he was trying to do, he had to let Rex die. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, like, it, there's always that dynamic in movies where stuff like that happens where, like, you know, no, that's the old me. I, I can't go back. I can't, you know, I can't have that back because right. I did these horrible things. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that, that could be a really interesting dynamic um, where, like, maybe he's the bad guy in Speed Racer 2. Yeah, you that's an interesting mean? twist, yeah. Like it's it the movie is about him and Speed's like they become rivals now that like racing's a little bit more opened up and you know, he's still trying to like ferret out the like the bad guys mm -hmm. and you know, Speed's like, dude, come on. Like what are you doing? <laughs> like it's things are different now. Yeah, but to Racer X, it, yeah, you're right, it would be no, there's still bad guys though. That's never going to change. And that would also be a good reason to maintain this Racer X identity. Because the work never ends. It's almost like superhero. It's like Batman. You know, it's yeah, not, it, never going to end. It's, it's very much like Batman. Like, it's, you know, there, there's always somebody else. And I think that that's been used quite a bit in, in Batman as a series, in the comics and, like, you know, the movies, is that, like, he can't let it go. Mm -hmm. Even when things, like, are in a time of calm. And I'm granted, in, in the comics and the movies and stuff, there's, like, that time of calm and then something catastrophic happens. Where, like, he almost lets the mantle go, but, mm -hmm. you know, then something really bad happens and, it, you know, it just keeps bringing him back in. But, I mean, that could be a really kind of interesting dynamic for a movie or even, like, I could see it maybe more as a series. Yeah, I think that could work that way, too. The last bit of trivia I have here, you had mentioned you had compared it to John Wick, which was perfect because Keanu Reeves in this movie, in this iteration, when the Wachowskis were making it, turned down the role of Racer X. And that's, yeah, someone they worked with oh, before. Man. Imagine how different that would have been, like the weight of, and I like Matthew Fox's iteration, but imagine that type of uh, Racer X instead. Yeah, see, I like Matthew Fox. I think he did a great job. Um Keanu Reeves in that role would have been really interesting. That, that budget would have gone way up too. <laughs> the budget would have gone way up, but also like the the draw power of Keanu Reeves, especially at that time, it could have been a very different situation in theaters. Yeah, I mean, do you market this as like Keanu Reeves is in it and he's Racer X, or do you leave that as a surprise in the movie where he takes off the helmet and he's like, I'm not your brother, and then you see, oh shit, it's fucking Keanu Reeves. No, it's definitely you, you, not porter <laughs> yeah you gotta you you have to market that he's in it but like not like on the poster you don't put like keanu reeves is racer x like right. but like just have that because i mean i'm sure they listed matthew fox as one of the stars of the movie yeah but they just don't tell you what it is you know it's like starring john goodman and susan sarandon and you know the cast in this it's kind of ridiculous for the time period honestly yeah <laughs> Like they, the the people that they pulled in was impressive, and I think that's a lot of that pull of the Wachowskis being some of the biggest directors at that time. That that's I don't I don't even know if Speed Racer would have happened even up to this point in 2021, a live action movie like this where it has over a hundred million dollars of budget, unless you had a big act or, or a big director that wanted to make the movie, and it's it's the Wachowskis because honestly I don't see how Speed Racer could work in any modern live action iteration uh, just from a studio like, oh, why don't we just do this? No, it would have to be a passion project, which is exactly what this was. Yeah, no, it, I don't really think it could work. It just wouldn't. I don't think it's something that would have occurred to a studio to just be like, hey, we want to make a Speed Racer movie. Go find a director. They were probably begging the Wachowskis, like, okay, well, if you're not going to make Ma Matrix 4, make something for us. What are you going to make? And this was probably like, we want to make Speed Racer. <laughs> They're like, all right. <laughs> They're like, um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> really? Speed Racer? <laughs> like like the cartoon with the monkey in the trunk? <laughs> and they're like, yeah. yes, and there's going to be a monkey in this too. Yeah, we, yep. we've made you millions. A hundred percent. There's going to be a monkey and he's going to be in the trunk at one point. <laughs> 
Most of the movie is going to be green screen and CGI. Okay, great. That'll save us on the monkey. No, but we want the monkey to be real. So we're going to pay an animal trainer. <laughs> of all the things not to computer generate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, but, it, but it worked so well. Like one of my favorite scenes is when they're like uh, the, the the younger one and the monkey are sitting there on the couch watching like that anime. <laughs> yes. And they're like on the couch and they're like, what are you doing? Nothing. Is it the same nothing that broke my couch? <laughs> Yeah, where they're recreating the anime, right? As yeah. if they're fighting. <laughs> it's it's great. Oh, it kind man. of reminds me of uh, there's uh Tim Pool. He's a like a political commentator, but he also has like a vlog about what goes on around like the studio and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the beginning, they hired an animator for just like side projects. But in the beginning, it's always like this like poorly drawn like anime style with like he's got this one cat that hangs around. And it's like him and the cat arguing about something and like they'll pull like katanas on each other and run at each other and whatnot. And <laughs> it, it just kind of reminds me of that, like that Godzilla type speech, you know, where it's like very abrupt, but it's in English and it's like, yeah. you, know, you dishonor your family, like that kind of stuff. <laughs> I also love the scene where they're watching the the race that speed's not supposed to be at. And then they quickly change it to something else and, and it's all very cartoony and anime and I'm like, yeah, no, get away with it. And he immediately throws speed under the bus too. When, as soon as he's caught. <laughs> yeah, no, he does. It, it, it's very, a little brother move. <laughs> right. <laughs> speed but then skiing. Also, I love when they, uh, they get there and like, obviously pops has been watching the race cause he saw all the gadgets that speed had to use. And he goes, the mock, mock fives, uh, off balance, isn't it? Like he just immediately like, yeah, you got all this cool sh- stuff, but I'm going to shit on it. And then, well, that's a nice thing where he's like, I'm not leaving. I'm going to continue racing. He's like, all right, well, then let's fix these things that they put in this car and make it run better. Because he's the real engineer. He knows how the Mach 5 works and moves. Yeah, and and that's part of the whole trope, even in the show, is like the Mach 5 is different from every other car. It's a character. Yeah, and it's it definitely works here, too. And, And you can see how much they really wanted to feature that car the vehicles at racer x i know they changed his look a little bit they went from like all white costume to black (laughs) but you know what i didn't mind it which honestly yeah i think that worked for the character exactly yeah it looked good it it wasn't like uh they actually made the costume they put the giant x on his fucking forehead (laughs) they did the whole thing (laughs) yeah oh man It it was just so well done for what it was Yeah, let's go ahead and give our closing thoughts on this retrospective. Uh, What would you overall think about this movie? It's over 10 years old. People are revisiting it. If they haven't seen it yet, it's on HBO Max. But uh, how would you go about trying to kind of encourage someone to, to give this a go? I would say that if you're looking for something to just sit back and enjoy, it's a great movie for that. If you're looking for something serious that you really want to dig into, it it doesn't have it, it's a lot is very surface level. But if you're looking for something to watch with like a young kid or that you know is into cars but not necessarily like into watching like, you know, a race like a like Formula 1 or NASCAR or anything like that yet. This is a great it's very video gamey with the yep. racing, which I think really works for like that younger audience. So I think it's it's a great kids movie. I agree. Yeah, it's it's great for kids. It's great for uh, fans of Speed Racer. So mo- adults, <laughs> there's no like kid Speed Racer fans right now that watch the anime. It's uh, it's uh, all adults, and there's enough in there. Like I said, they even recreate the opening to Speed Racer where he jumps out of the car and does that pose. Like they did that at the end of the Monte Cristo win. Yep. So it's like there's enough in there for the fans. They you can tell it was made by fans. And they really treated this with a lot of care and a lot of love in spite of how it ended up doing in the box office. I feel like they ended up doing the project that they wanted to make. That sounds like they're, they haven't spoken about, about any kind of studio interference at that time. They truly trusted him with it for better or for worse, but I think for better in the end, because we ended up getting a movie that is standing the test of time. It's getting that following that people are are like, hey, you know what, let me give that a shot. I know I didn't watch it then, and then they find out that it's actually a, a pretty good movie. So uh, it's, it's one of those moments where you can make a great movie, or you can make a movie now that's going to make you a lot of money, but are people still going to remember it in five years? You know, are people talking about Ant-Man, you know, five years from now? So I hope not. Uh, or are you going to make a good movie that people are going to forever enjoy, 
and that it ended up working out with Speed Racer. It worked out with the Iron Giant. These are things that are not necessarily franchises. You're not going to get sequels out of them, but they're going to be movies that are going to be enjoyed by more than I think what you initially expected as a filmmaker as like, okay, this general audience is like, no, even many over de decades from now, people are going to be talking about this movie. And I think Speed Racer is going to be one of those that is going to just continue to be talked about as we continue to move forward. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll put it this way. Like when I first started it with when I was watching it with my kid, he he's never seen Speed Racer. He's never seen the cartoon. He's got nothing in it. And by the end of it, in the ending credit scene, he's like jumping up on around on the bed and, and singing the song. So nice. I mean, it works. It just is a fun movie. That's great, man. Are you going to show him the old cartoon now? <laughs> I might. Um, he's a little picky about He doesn't actually really like cartoons for the most part, which is kind of weird. I mean, maybe he'll grow into it. But, I mean, he watches, like, a very particular few. And well, I think that's kind of like a generational thing, though, too. Because if you think about it, like, all of the things that he has to watch... Yeah, well, let me ask you this. When you say cartoon, he doesn't like cartoons. Do you mean like hand-drawn animation, or does that include CG shows? Um, He doesn't really watch a lot of CG shows. Interesting. Honestly. um, He watches like a couple. Um, He went through phases where he was like super into Paw Patrol, which I'm so glad that he's over because it is <laughs> the worst way to run a city I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> but no, he kind of tends more towards like um, I had him watching, what was that? The, the, you ever watched the elephant show as a kid? No. It was just like, a, it was a kid's show, and I don't really even know why they called it the elephant show, because he was only in the beginning. Like, it was a dude <laughs> in an elephant suit. Um, but it's just like songs and, you know, like, just kind of like, you know, life lessons and whatnot. But he really enjoys that. Um, he enjoys, like, the Muppets a lot. Okay. But he's just, I don't know, for some reason, he's just more into, like, you know, things that are real. And yeah, I think it could be a side effect of, like, you know, YouTube and, you know, a lot of that stuff. It's like, you know, real kids, like, God, I, I hate Ryan with a passion. I don't know if you've stumbled into that. No, Seth no. Pool. No, that's don't. a YouTube show, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's awful. And what's funny is you can, about it, is you can actually watch, like, the degeneration into, like, obviously the kid didn't want to do it anymore. So the parents just kind of continued because, like, it's their whole business now. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I know Leo likes his animated shows, and but it is it is CG. That's why I was kind of curious. He doesn't watch the hand-drawn as much, except for Batman the Animated Series sometimes. But otherwise, yeah. I think you're right. As a whole, it does seem to be a generational thing of hand-drawn animation is not the standard. Therefore, kids are not exposed to it as often. Therefore, they're not going to be as drawn to those things. So yeah, yeah that's exactly. pretty interesting. One thing you might want to show Leo, too, is uh, I don't know if you've ever watched Steven Universe. I, I never saw it. I know the lazy gaming guys do. So I, I think I was just a little too old for it. But you you uh, you recommend it for younger kids? Yeah, it's it's kind of it's cute. And it by the end of it, it gets surprisingly deep, which was kind of unexpected. So, I mean, it's got something for adults, too. Nice. Um, But, yeah, no, I mean, he really enjoyed that. I think we just finished that like last weekend watching through it. And that's on HBO Max, too. Yeah, yeah that, I know it is, and uh, I think the reason why I never gave it a shot is because of the Tumblr crowd that ended up, like, really fucking up the creator, <laughs> you know, where they got really into the gender politics over some character in there, and she, I guess, did the wrong thing with that character, and they all got upset and started sending her death threats, and that's when I was just like, fuck that show, <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, it sounds like it reminds me of Adventure Time from what you're describing where, yeah, it does get kind of deep and heavy towards the end. Yeah, no, it's actually kind of similar in a lot of ways to to Adventure Time. Yeah, honestly, screw Tumblr. Who cares? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> like, that site died when they got rid of porn, so it, it, <laughs> it's done. <laughs> Well, Jared, I do appreciate you taking the time and, and re-watching Speed Racer from 2008 and coming on here and talking about it. You know, that that was awesome, and you clearly really enjoyed it and have a passion for talking about uh, this movie. So I really appreciate you taking the time and making this retrospective episode for the rest of the Brokehead Core out there. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure. And in case they want to continue talking about Speed Racer or maybe go into some of the other things that you share, uh, where can they find you on oh. Twitter or anywhere else? Oh, let's see. All right. On Twitter, I am at Spoon Sandwich, um, S-P-O-O-N-S-A-M-M-I-C-H. And then obviously I'm on the Discord. Uh, you can always find me there. That's about it. I don't really use anything else these days. 
it's pretty much all you need, really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I have Facebook, but nobody cares. And, and like the other day when it went down, I was like, oh, well, good thing I mainly use Twitter. So <laughs> whatever. Honestly, no, when it went down, I was kind of like, I hope it never comes back. <laughs> How much better would the world be in general if Facebook just stopped existing? Because <laughs> also it took down Instagram. Yes. Uh, WhatsApp, I realize, is like something that like people who have family out of the yes. country used to communicate. So like, obviously, I, I want that to come back. But there's other alternatives that aren't owned by Facebook. Mm hmm productivity probably went up really high that that day <laughs> <laughs> it was the most work they've gotten done in years and i love that twitter was chugging along too like they were struggling like all of these people going to twitter and they're like oh shit <laughs> yeah no that that was having issues um telegram which i use mostly for like messaging with like family and stuff like that also had a lot of issues but they had a large influx of people going onto their network and that's all like blockchain based so mm. it, it's scalable but it took them a minute yeah, well, I will have links to Jared's Twitter and the Discord on the description of today's episode. Otherwise, for everywhere else you can find us, head on over to thereasonsimbroke.com. You will find a link on there, including to the Patreon, which if you are listening to this on Patreon, you are hearing this a full month ahead of public release. Otherwise, if you're hearing this on your favorite podcatcher, you can enjoy other retrospectives or episodes uh, way ahead of time. Every week, you do get it at least a couple days early before it releases on Sundays. But otherwise, you also get these bonus episodes that you get to enjoy a full month before everyone else. So that's at patreon.com slash the reasons I'm broke. Otherwise, thank you all once again. Thank you again, Jared, for doing today's episode. And Brokehead Core, all will be well. Which is the one gadget, Jared, in the, in the Mach 5 or the Mach 6 in that bit of modification? Not counting the tire, because we know the tire is the best one. But which <laughs> one would you choose to put into your Mach 5? Oh, man. That's tough. I would probably say, if I'm using, am I using it to race or just to go to work? Just to go to work. This is your personal vehicle. The jumper. I, it was so fucking useful, wasn't it? <laughs> Can you imagine just being like, there's like that one guy on the highway, like in front of you, and you just <laughs> right boom, over boom, him. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> yeah, no, 100% the jumper in that capacity. Like, if I'm racing and there's people trying to slash my tires, like the tire shields seem pretty cool. Yes. But no, the, if I'm just using it to like go to work, like, yeah, no, definitely the uh, the jump jack or whatever it's called. That was my first answer too, but just to give a different answer, I really like the the fucking the giant saws on the front like i thought that was I, they he should have used that way more <laughs> against a bunch of those cars especially right like that feel that feels like that would have easily mowed down so many of these guys and and tore up their tires and their cars and all of that uh so I, that that would just be a good intimidation one too when i'm driving around busting those things <laughs> out <laughs> and you can instead of flashing your lights at people you just open up these saw blades <laughs> in front of your car <laughs> <laughs> Then they'll really fucking move. <laughs> yeah, exactly.